Uh, I'm Munish Chandel. I'm back, and uh, you know, on uh, Saturday we start talking about the waste management, which largely means uh, solid waste management. Uh, we I introduced to what will be taught in this course, and today I will have two more lectures, and we'll discuss further about the solid waste management. As I mentioned, we are largely talking about municipal solid waste management, which is a prime concern. You know, uh, because many of your queries says that, you know, we should cover this, that, uh, and many other topics which are really interesting, for example, hazardous waste, industrial waste, and many more. You see, uh, if you uh, see this environmental studies or environmental science and engineering course, it's very difficult to teach this course. Uh, when I say it's very difficult to teach this course, why? Because you know it's so broad and wide, and there are so many issues and questions which need to be answered by all of us. And most of them, I would say, you know, all are relevant, all are important. So the question comes for this course is that how and how much I can teach in uh, this particular course rather than going away from you know to very important questions for example deforestation what happens in this city what happens that for example someone even asked rightly so what corruption okay so you know what uh, we have to try on which uh, I have also tried and you should also try when teaching that do not allow this course to go far away from what you want to teach. So that means you have to fix your curriculum telling and believing that this is what I have to complete, this is what I have to teach. Otherwise all issues are important and everything is interesting. So you will otherwise end up having a course or taking your discussion in direction which has probably then most of the, your contents are not covered. So that kind of uh, thing need to be considered. Please consider that when you are teaching it. And we also try to do that. So that means we have to find that what is important, how I can, what can be taught in let's say 40 hours of lecturing and then a few hours of tutorials. You know, and also when he says that we can give assignments to students, true, we can give assignments to students, that's true. But for example, if a student is doing six courses, then if we believe that he can uh, be asked to read for let's say 16 hours or 14 hours, that means he just have six hours of assignment time for all six courses. That means one hour per day kind of thing. So you can give assignments, but if they are infinite assignments and too long, probably you shouldn't expect results. Because if you give something which is infinite, he knows that, okay, I cannot do it, so I won't do it, okay. So uh, coming to uh, then what we teach here at IIT Bombay is the, after talking about transportation, we talk about transformation. So what is transformation? Transformation for many of us is actually you can other, in other lines, in other words you can call it is a treatment of waste. And that is the component which is missing largely in India because we collect waste, probably not using the most optimized, most critical path, but will still be collected because this is a responsibility and this need to be done otherwise the, the communities, the people living in municipality will be in trouble. Okay? But after that, the transformation which actually means treatment is missing and that is what we will talk today and that is what is, we will talk about what is relevant in, in India and how many other countries are doing it. So why should we transform or uh, uh, treat our waste? In fact, if we treat our waste, it will lead to efficient storage, handling and transport. It reduces the disposal cost that how much ultimately we have to spend on the final disposal. It will stabilize our waste and destroy the toxic elements such as chemicals and biological entity. And in many cases, we can generate some useful energy, which we will talk also, and then we can reuse part of our waste. Okay, so that's why we should think of transforming our waste so that least amount of waste is going to the final disposal and we are using it one way or another. Okay, so there are different methods as everyone of us knows. There are physical methods, there are chemical methods, and also the biological methods. So, for example, when I say that physical treatment, basically it's, it means a few things that I separate different components, I reduce volume, or even I reduce size. So, how can I separate com different components? I can do it manually, for example. I can have a conveyor belt on the waste is moving, and I have several people who are separating, for example, paper, plastic, 
wood, maybe stone and maybe some kind of electronic waste which probably can be hazard etc. And we can do it by different mechanical methods which we will talk little bit later. And then another way is volume reduction, for example, compaction, compaction is a good way of reducing the volume, otherwise if you are not reducing volume at and different levels, it will lead to a different uh, lot of cost in the transportation for example. And then the third one is the size reduction, for example, if I want to do further treatment, what I sometimes have to do is reduce the size of the material, so that you know my different uh, machineries can work on that. So that is what the physical transformation, the, then the second component of the treatment is the chemical transformation. For example, the one which is significantly important for our waste is the combustion and you must have heard that we generally call it incineration for solid waste. So what is incineration combustion? Everyone, every one of you or your students may be knowing it. It is basically thermal oxidation that means at elevated temperature. We oxidize our waste to final products such as carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide and other oxidation products and of course we get a small amount or depending on the waste amount of good amount of ash maybe. So what is the advantage of combustion or incineration? We every one of us knows that it reduces the mass and volume considerably. However, it can also produce air pollutants which we will talk little bit later and the second trans chemical transformation transformation could be pyrolysis. In pyrolysis, uh, we do not pass oxidation, oxygen, it is a destructive thermal destruction at elevated temperature, but in the absence of additional air or oxygen. And what we get is the tar oil, we get pyrolytic oil and sometimes some gases which can be further used and then of course we get char also. Then the third one is the gasification, it is a partial oxidation somewhere in between combustion and pyrolysis. We use some amount of uh, air or some amount of oxygen so that our solid waste is converted into a synthetic gas which largely contains carbon monoxide and hydrogen and that actually is that uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen is a fuel, it is a low calorific fuel that can be further used for different purposes even for example running gas turbine or even for some kind of processes etc. So there are different ways this chemical transformation method, the incineration is the one which uh, we will talk and which is used, but pyrolysis and gasification are also options. Uh, uh, there are these things are tried in a very small scale and I would say that not much that much commercialized especially for solid waste. Then the most important one if you remember I told you that uh, up to 40 to 50 percent of our MSW basically is biodegradable. So that means the biological treatment options certainly has to play a big, big role. So what we can do with our waste largely we can compost it or we can do anaerobic digestion. When we talk about compost it is basically a conversion into uh, uh, it is a, a biological conversion in, in the presence of air or in the presence of aerobes uh, that means we are using largely aerobic bacteria. So what do we produce is the compost, it is basically a humus material which actually you may be knowing that you know the composting is the most common thing which people think or people know about the solid waste and in fact uh, one of our uh, participant even told that she has composting happening in her, in her, in her house also. So that is one method which probably can be used and the second one is the anaerobic digestion. It could be at low density for example, what I do is I mix some of my MSW biodegradable composition with water, mix it properly and make it a slurry or I can have a high concentration uh, solid, but the concentration the amount of water I add is little bit less. So that process is an called anaerobic digestion. In fact, if you understand it that basically what we call is biogas generation, we generate biogas which has methane and carbon dioxide also, but this methane actually is a fuel and in many places we can use this for the generation of electricity with the generation of energy. For example, we can burn it especially if you are for example, if your institutions like IITs or other institution we can, gen, uh, we can produce this biogas and use in hostels etc. So these two methods of biological transformation are I would say commonly used in the developed countries and now increasing in India also and very important for us for the reason because most of our waste or let us say half of our waste is actually biodegradable and those technology will be relevant. 
So when we start, when we talk about what method to use, actually they, these physical, chemical and biological methods, especially physical and biological methods are used together. For example, you must have understood that, for example, if I want to put my waste in a anaerobic diester or sometime in composting unit, so I have to shred it, I have to make it into pieces. Or for example, if I have to use plastic, etc., further even for pyrolysis, etc., so I have to shred it. So we can use different kind of shredders. You understand shredder, we use shredders nowadays in our houses, in the kitchens to shred the vegetables, etc. So that kind of, the, the principle is same. It's basically shear shredders, so we can use it. And in fact, they are used in many of our processes. And the another physical method of, uh, for example, used, commonly used in MSW management is trommel screen. You may have still seen, if you see in this picture, I do not know how good uh, the quality is, but if you see there are series of trommel screens here, okay. So what happens here is basically it is a rotating screen which has uh, slots on that. So that means you, you put your waste from one side, for example, in the first trommel screen, it rotates and it moves your material. So the material which is finer than the slot, it will come out and the remaining will go to the next uh, uh, next trommel screen which is a little bit coarser uh, uh, slots and then it goes to the little bit more coarser. So this is one way of uh, separating the material, the solid waste based on the size, okay. So you can first for example shred it and then put in the trommel screen or you will straight away put your waste into a, into the series of trommel screen depending on what you want to do after. Okay, and then uh, there are, you see, as I mentioned that in our MSW, there are uh, different components. I would say that we, if you want to classify, there may be, let us say, 20 odd components. So uh, to separate them physically or even to deal with them separately, you need a combination of technologies. It may be that you need a shredder, you need a trommel screen or you may also need air classifier. So air classifier is nothing but a system which is developed to separate uh, uh, different materials of your MSW based upon their density, okay. The, if they are very, uh, they are less dense, they can flow with your air and uh, for example can be, uh, can be separated uh, from the heavy materials. For example, if you see the simple schematic here, this is your MSW feeded in a system which is which has a air flow, vertical air flow and once you mix this waste with air, so the lighter fraction of course will, will be uh, transported along with air here and the heavy fraction because, they, because of their heavy, uh, because of high mass, they, because of the gravity force, they will fall here and once they go away, you have, can have a further blower, etc. if it is required. And then go to a cyclone separator. So what is a cyclone separator? Basically it separates your gas and solid. So all these solids, because once we have increased the area here, they will fall here and the exhaust air will, will take away, will go away. And then probably it may not be good idea just to allow this air to go to the atmosphere. So what you have to do is put it back probably. Otherwise it will, it will be, many times you will be contaminated air. So you can use air classifier also, for example, if you want to remove, let us say, paper, air classifier will work nicely, okay. So what I am trying to say is there are different methodologies which are to be used either in combination or individually depending on what you want to do with your waste, okay. Then the another one, uh, you may be knowing that a, I think less than 1 percent or depending on uh, where, but a good amount of your material can be ferromagnetic in nature that means it's it has magnetic characteristics so that means we can use magnetic separators so what is a magnetic separator what we do is you put your waste on a conveyor belt and you transport it here and then you have another conveyor belt but which has magnet on th which has a magnet onto that and what happens when you your waste goes here because this magnetic field here this your waste is picked up and your magnetic material is picked up. And when it reaches towards the end of the conveyor belt, this magnetic field is released. So all your magnetic material will fall here, the remaining portion will follow. So this is a one way of separating your ferromagnetic materials from the non-ferrous or non-ferromagnetic materials. So it is an interesting idea and 
what will happen sometimes it, it will also pick some of impurities because many times it is the many impurities are Im embedded in with each other. So, we will find that there are some non uh, ferrous material also coming here. So, what you can do is this you can have this system in series ok. So, that means in the, in the later stages probably it will be further refined ok. So, this is used for the separation of mag magnetic material. So, all this in fact, if you if you if you see any of uh, your uh, environmental studies or solid waste management, there are numerous other technologies also. I just wanted to give you an example that how these technologies are used and how they many of them work. So, the most important technology as I mentioned is biological processes and out of that the composting is the most simplest one. You know, it is a it is a kind of many times I call it as a free process where you have to do nothing but just have a should have a system where biologically aerobically your waste will be composted ok. So, composting has several advantage you may be knowing it that it transport biodegradable compound into biological stable matter and it reduces the volume many times it reduces the mass also it destroys the pathogen in insect. This is very important because otherwise what will happen is that this waste in itself if we do not do the composting etcetera and put it in for agriculture use or put it into our crops etcetera that that will carry pathogens that may be dangerous. So, that means basically this composting can reduce pathogens and whatever we get after composting is a humus like material which actually can be uh, which is rich in nutrients and which can be act as a stabilizer or st soil conditioner actually ok. So, along with your fertilizer you can use this in your agriculture farm. You may be knowing that uh, the composting is a thing which is tried in many parts of our country and in fact, we are doing it even now. There are some issues with that especially when we are doing it large scales where are the markets ok. For example, if you see our waste is generated in the cities and the largely the agriculture areas are should be away from the city. So, probably the question comes that where is the market for that and what were the transportation cost. The biggest challenge what has happened with the composting in India is its its content. If we do not segregate waste properly if for example, we do not have system for dry and wet waste if we mix for example, glass inert materials plastic etcetera with this material and then make a compost and then sell it to farmers probably there will be they will be uh, this compost will destroy their farms and you know there will be for example, if it is a glass is there then there will be problem with that. So, in the large scale there have been some issues dealing with the composting, but nevertheless composting could be a good choice. There are different ways of doing composting one is uh, the conventional way of we, we pile our waste we have uh, we have long long piles of our waste which is called windrow composting. Sometime uh, we have now rotary drums basically they are drums half filled off with the waste and then rotate maybe once in hour or once in a minute actually in very low speed and little bit more comp uh, controlled system. And nowadays or actually not nowadays, but for many years now we are also looking into worming composting especially if you have a uh, land is available. Please remember that this composting ex actually needs a lot of area and a lot of land. So, if if you are dealing with this waste in a very uh, in a city where the land is very precious and not available then we have to see how to uh, use these technologies. So, I will show you what how the bin row composting will look like. Yeah. So, if you can see here these are basically uh, these are the basically bin rows where you have piled your waste ok. And you see the, uh, so, this aerobic uh, this composting is generally aerobic process what you have to do is you have to make sure that there is a certain amount of air available for bacteria to survive. But also you have to maintain the temperature otherwise what will happen if you do not pile it if you do not maintain the temperature the process is really slow that process will become really slow. For example, you may you may be knowing that initially this this by biological process the temperature will really go up let us say 45 degree even as high as 45 degree centigrade. So, this temperature for at least for initial few weeks need to be maintained. If you do not maintain it what will happen is that uh, the, the biological process will slow down and it will take a longer much longer time. So, what you do is you pile it here maybe after 7 day or 8 days you put it you move it tilt it to the next level and then after 7 days to next level and let us say in 2 months or so 
here where it's, it is maturing for a few one or two weeks further and this composting should be ready uh, f for the for the commercial use then you can s send it to maybe the commercial vendors or the farmers please remember that once we produce compost we need, we need to separate some of the components for example what generally the people have done is once it's produced compost is produced you again do the uh, use trommel screens etc so that you can uh, segregate the material which otherwise is not required farmers by the farmers okay so this is the simplest one called windrow composting very relevant for country like india especially for the small uh, for the small size cities where the land is not that big problem however uh, you have be able to see whether uh, this can be even used for the larger cities so this is uh, one picture show uh, here taken in in the mumbai itself on from where they are doing the bim bindro composting basically it's a semi digested waste okay so for example you will still see that there is a good amount of plastic etc here so basically if before it goes to farmers it need to be separated and actually in this site particular site they do it they separate these materials by using trommel screens okay this is the final product produced you can see the color it is very fine in fact everything including all this plastic and all these materials which otherwise shouldn't go to the go to the field is removed here so this is this is the final product and ready to, for putting into the, into the farms okay the, the another one for example what has happened is that if you want to do this uh, composting windrow composting especially in the open area etc sometime if it is very close to the communities uh, there is some issues of orders etc you know it's although it's a bio aerobic process but still sometime there were there are issues of the uh, the order uh, etc so you can do it this composting in more uh, control uh, fashion which is called rotary drum composting especially for example even in institutions like yours probably you can instead of having open uh, windrow composting probably rotary drum composting could be a good idea so what is uh, so this is uh, this is a typical view of a rotary drum in fact it's a it's a big drum depending upon what is the requirement largely maybe half filled or so that there is enough space for air movement etc you fill it from one side and it's so many times it's on slope so it slowly slowly moves and let's say in two or two weeks or even three weeks this can come out of it so what is the advantage here you can regulate your air flow if you want you can easily maintain the temperature etc so basically it's a controlled system rather than doing it in open you can control it further and if for example if order is produced you know that order is a big issue for solid waste management you know many of uh, our plants in fact their success will depend whether they produce an order or no for example i was talking to someone uh, from a municipality they are saying that the biggest problem we are facing uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the people is order for example if your site is having order people bond accept your technology irrespective of how good the technology is so in fact in this system you have a system in which you can extract uh, the gas which is produced and you know pass through even a biofilter so that the order is not there okay otherwise sometime it, it is not always but in mineral composting etc there is sometime the problem of order is there so this is a more controlled uh, controlled way of uh, controlled way of doing it uh and i would say a better way for a uh, institutions or for the small scale okay uh, for example iit roorkee has mastered some of this systems for rotary drum composting and many others are also working on that then the the third one which many of you are fa familiar with or especially in the rural uh, settings the people use earth bombs okay instead of using bacteria they use earth bombs for composting of organic matter uh there are, these are these bombs are and you know this on this rainy season is coming you will find that there are bombs everywhere especially in iid bombay we find in the campus if in a big after a big rain there are number of bombs the which are uh, lying or moving on the road but and they are very interesting for example 1 kg of bombs can consume 1 kg of residue every day that's that's good amount but it's not that all the bombs which we get in our locality etc they will they will do the vermi composting of course they can do vermi composting but the rate is very low and you don't get these results of 1 kg for uh, in a in a day of food 
So, uh, we have uh, in fact imported one imported uh, worms for example, this Eudrilis eugene and is Isenia fetida they basically are uh, the I think one is of African origin and another uh, another is I do not know Europe or somewhere else. So, they actually are much faster and uh, you know they cost a lot for example, someone told me it, it cost nearly rupees 1000 for 1 kg, but then you do not have to buy uh, many of them you know they, they produce so fast and in fact, many of someone was telling me that even this is a business for many of because you produce those worms and then sell it for that vermicomposting. Okay. So, this is another way especially uh, in the in the in the small scale this can be used I do not know many plants which are used in the large scale, but vermicomposting is one of option and the residue for example, the excreta coming from this worm is also rich in the nutrient and very stable material. So, that again can be put in agriculture farms etcetera. So, the one important technology which is uh, emerging in many ways or especially in if you see in Europe etcetera, they are uh, when people are thinking of you know one way is to deal with waste is think it is a waste and so another way is that in fact, there are so many materials in the waste which can be used either one in one form or another. And with this perspective many of people are thinking that okay, composting is a good idea, but if what if we can even generate some useful energy because energy is a energy is a new concern along with uh, uh, other things. So, uh, for that matter the anaerobic digestion of solid waste especially the biodegradable waste is a is a is a is an idea which uh, many of European countries are exploring and in fact using it. So, what do we do is instead of uh, having the aerobic conditions we have anaerobic conditions we have anaerobic bacteria we take food largely or maybe sometimes even the sewage sludge can be used and put into a digestion tank there are different ways of doing it there are batch systems there are continuous system and convert it into in a reasonable time let us say 3 weeks or 4 weeks into biogas which is largely methane and some amount of CO2 and H2S etcetera. This can be done in, in many settings especially it should be good in the small scales there are all there have been it has been tried in India on the larger scale for example, Lucknow is one example where they tried in larger scale there had been some issues if dealing with it in a larger scale because if our waste is not segregated remember that any of biological processes will not work so nicely. Okay. It is something like someone is given a food, but a good amount of food is either of no use and maybe even injurious or even may be toxic. So, that is exactly what has happened with these systems because in our commingled waste we generally have batteries, we have stones, we have all kind of mixed materials we try to segregate them then the segregate is not 100 percent efficient and then in our digestion tanks we end up having a mixture of waste which is not necessarily biodegradable, but also other materials. So, that kind of challenges has happened, but nevertheless if we have dry and wet waste segregated this technology can work nicely and you can generate useful energy. This is a, a nice schematic of a system which is uh, developed by uh, Dr. Kale from uh, Bark Baba Atomic Research Center. He uh, actually has pioneered this technology for, for many years now if you see he has I think more than 200 plants in India which are uh, many of them working nicely. So, what is this is this is a big tank an digestion tank and this is a methane or biogas holder. So, the biogas is generated here and this is this holder it is a movable holder it collects all our gas all the gas here and then it can be used uh, for example, either in your canteen or if in the hostel etcetera. For example, in the bar campus they are using it for in the canteen uh, for the preparation of food etcetera. Okay. So, whatever residue is coming out they have uh, called manure pits basically they are the sand beds uh, where they are removing the solid materials from the uh, and removing water and okay, putting it back. So, that you know it's, it does not uh, lead to the water pollution. And if you can see here there is also a heating system. So, what they are using they are so using solar heater. So, that if your part of your uh, reactor is uh, heated in fact, it is a, a two stage reactor where the, this one first stage is thermophilic 
aerobic in nature and the second stage is anaerobic in nature. Okay, there are different types of them used or developed commercially many even in India. Okay, as I mentioned if your waste is segregated, it is biodegradable waste then certainly these technologies work nicely. If your waste is mixed then there are different issues, different challenges, toxicity issues for the bacteria is there. Okay? So, but in small scale certainly these systems can work. So, you know the interesting uh, question comes and many of uh, you may be thinking on the same line is that we can generate energy. And of course, we can generate energy for example, I already told what anaerobic digestion, but the question is that how much is that energy, will it offset the total cost of our these kind of systems or not. Okay? So, there are and how much biogas can we generate, there are uh, simple uh, ways of doing it say of approximating how much biogas we can be generated, all standard books has that, but I generally do not teach that part in my class because that certainly will take half of the lecture which is little bit longer for this course. But uh, there are some studies done for example, this one company Western Packs has done a study what they did is that they take 150 tons per day of MSW and they, as you, they calculate that it can produce 14,000 meter cube of biogas with a methane content of as high as 55 to 65 percent and which can be used to produce 1.2 megawatt of power. That is very interesting that means, if I have approximately let us say 150 tons per day of waste coming I can produce 1.2 megawatt of power. So, that is very good idea for example, if I assume that the uh, Mumbai's MSW is approximately 7000 tons per day, it will produce 56 megawatt of electricity for me. Okay, and that is that is a decent amount, but then it you compare how much electricity we are using in the whole Mumbai. So, that means this is even less than 1 percent of the total Mumbai's electricity consumption and is it how much in terms of money. So, what I request is and I have requested I generally request this in the my class also that if I assume that I am generating 50 megawatt of electricity from 7000 tons of per day, then how much revenue can be generated from this on the annual basis. And if I assume that I need approximately let us say 4 or to 5 rupees per kg for the my based system for my based management system, how much of that can be even offset by using the electricity generated of that. So, uh, please do that calculation so that I can also talk to many of you it has been uh, calculate assuming the same system which is shown in the slides assuming it be it Mumbai for everyone and calculate how much electricity we can generate annually and what will be the revenue view that we electricity generate and how much is that in compare to the money we have to spend on the dealing with the waste. If I assume let us say 5 rupees per kg for the total waste management. So, I give you let us say 3 to 4 minutes for this uh, calculation you can talk to your, uh, your colleagues, your friends and maybe do it together and but I would be happy if you can tell me that how much of this will offset. For example, this is equal to 10 percent of the total cost it can offset or 50 offset or 50 percent or so. Okay? So, I give 3 to 4 minutes and maybe then I will come up to a few centers. Hello Mahatma Gandhi, Noida. So, uh, have you calculated? For example, if if I ask you that how much revenue it can we generate? If we consider that uh, total generation of solid weight is 1500 uh, ton per day, yeah. then the total of uh, uh, 14 into 10 to the power meter cube biogas generated. So, about 12 megawatt uh, power is generated, electricity is generated by uh, the solid waste per day. 12 megawatt, okay. Any other question you have from Mahatma Gandhi? So, my question is that uh, what we, what I know is that transformation of waste is uh, that 
you are changing the comp you are changing the ways uh, mechanically or in any other way but without recovery of any energy but in your slide you have shown that uh, even uh, the recovery of energy comes under transformation so is it right uh, yeah what like in, uh, so anything annual of the government of india manual if you see that transformation they say is anything you do just to make it uh, more uh, compact or shredding or anything but without recovery of uh, energy yeah very good so i think uh, for me the transformation is anything we transform whether it produces energy it produces useful material doesn't matter okay so if it is written in that way in manual probably we have to rethink on what is written in the manual okay it doesn't matter whether we produce energy or not produce transformation is transforming it to some other form if it produces products useful products good anyone else thank you sir i think no more questions from okay, this side sure okay kathal hctm hello sir good afternoon sir how are you yeah so can you just fine sir Uh, do this that calculation which i mentioned could you do that the calculation is going on sir but there is a query regarding vermi composting sir yeah you have told us two species eugenia and icenia fetida sir yeah so this is a dry area in which approximately 400 to 500 mm rainfall is receiving this area per annum sir yeah so uh, which species is suitable for vermi composting in this particular arid area sir very good question okay So what you have to do is you have to uh, call to Jiju Hisar. You know Jiju Hisar. Yes, sir, I know. Yeah. So and call to uh, uh, Doctor Garg. Doctor V K Garg is there. And he I is an expert. No, Doctor Kumar Garg. Huh? Yeah. So you ask him, and he is an expert on warming composting. So he will tell you which one you should use in your, in your, in the arid areas. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Any other question? Thanks, sir. Yeah. So pl please try to do that calculation, and you know why I am giving you this calculation is to give an idea, to give an insight, to understand that how much of our cost of our treatment, our whole uh, solid waste management can be dealt when we are talking about generation of some energy. Okay. So that's the reason why this uh, numerical, small, simple numerical is given. Thank you very much. Shri Vaishnav Institute, Madhya Pradesh. So, could you do that calculation? In Indore, we are having a sewage treatment plant, sir, and they are generating 22 kilowatt power daily, and with the capacity of 122 mld daily. They are having that sewage treatment plant, and they are generating the electricity. Indore Municipal Corporation. They just started the sewage treatment plant. They are generating the electricity power. So it's a biogas plant. Yes, sir. Very good. Uh, so, what is the question? Sir, my question is: There are two methods of biological transformation of uh, solid waste. One is aerobic method. Another one is anaerobic method. Yeah. In anaerobic method of digestion, we are giving, we are getting the biogas also. That is the advantage. Yes. So, uh, there are these two methods. so this method is more economical more efficient and more successful okay very good very question good? yeah okay very good question so i i think the the question those who couldn't hear is that there are biological there are two ways of biological methods aerobic and anaerobic anaerobic is also produces energy uh, that means biogas so which one is good so you see uh, it's very difficult to tell depending on situation you have to use it but the aerobic process is generally as are economically cheaper the cost is on the lower side okay but in the on the other hand the anaerobic system can produce you energy so you have to offset base to have to calculate the cost to benefit analysis but if you ask me that i don't want to invest i just want something which works for me i will start with aerobic processes but if i am able to invest money and you know want to even produce energy then i will go with anaerobic processes okay there are certain advantages and disadvantages of both the processes so you have to see that which one is good for uh, for us for example once you have done anaerobic process then again that residue which is coming sometime we have to do again the anaerobic composting of that so anaerobic little bit will be on expensive side but then there is the 
energy generated out of it and of course but the investment is on the higher side very good question so what i request you all is just do that calculation and if someone has done this calculation please tell me that how much this energy can offset the total cost so very interesting questions you know uh, you many of you are of course teaching this course uh, probably even longer than what i'm uh, what i'm teaching here so it would be interesting it would be nice if you if you have some interesting uh, way of teaching some of these materials if you can share the your ideas so that it's it shouldn't be a one bit traffic ultimately the our whole goal of this workshop is is to to discuss and to understand how this course can be uh, delivered to the students most effectively so if you are using some good methods and if you think they're working nicely please share with us please share on the moodle etc okay so that will that will help in developing this course for the benefit of all the students so you know i talked about uh, biological processes uh, very interesting processes uh, there are different challenges in in fact there is no full proof technology for anything there will be issues which need to be dealt locally for all kind of technologies be it biological non biological physical etc etc and then the another route which uh, many of uh, many of us will be thinking or especially on books is the waste to energy uh, i mean waste to energy is any system in which we can generate energy but this incineration largely is a called system in which uh, which which we call them waste to energy so basically it's a thermal route instead of going the biological processes or uh, we can go the thermal route which is called incineration which is called waste to energy you know this is a again a very simple okay not so simple but very interesting process what you do is you take your waste pass into a combustion chamber pass air so that there is sufficient air for the combustion the heat will be generated you can extract that heat generate uh, run a steam boiler and produce steam and then steam can produce electricity etc or in some cases you can just simply burn it because uh, what is whether we can generate energy or not generate energy will depend on the calorific value of our waste okay and the incinerator shouldn't be considered just like a simple burning system but we should have uh, all air pollution control devices we have regulations for that we should at least have a at, at least let's say wet scrubber and then let's say filter fabric filter for particulate matter control etc so this is here uh, this flue gas is going out we have couple of then there is a wet scrubber and then there is a filter and then this flue gas is going to stack and after this this burning here this uh, ash is uh, going to the ash collection system and collected then cooled and then maybe disposed of okay so this thermal route is another way in many places it's seen in different ways for example we are now trying to go in thermal routes uh, especially in delhi if you see there are couple of plants now in operation there are concern about the air pollution and they are also concerned that what is the calorific value of our waste for example you know if our collection systems are open system for example we are allowing to air uh, to water etc to in especially rainy season to pour in so what will be the calorific value of waste and if i am saying 30 40% of inert materials which probably has no calorific value then then the viability of this system need to be explored but in addition to the calorific thing calorific value things you may be knowing that many countries even many developing countries do not want to use incinerators and for that matter okay this waste energy systems are the same so why because there is a concern about the air pollution so it is many of these countries also are seeing it something like this that you have problem which is called solid waste and then you are burning it and then creating air pollution that is then the problem of air so you know it's not at all a good idea to convert your one polar problem to another problems so if you see there are several numerous air pollutants which will come out of incineration for example organic compounds dioxin and furon if you read nowadays any newspaper any every now and then they will say that oh x y g burning has led to of waste has led to dioxin formation and furon formation there are polychlorinated biophenyls there are vocs there are 
polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and there are benzenes, chlorinated benzenes. There are heavy metals produced actually arsenic, cadmium, chromium, copper, mercury, manganese, nickel, lead. Of course, it depends what is in your waste. And then this particulate matter in overall 2.5 PM10. Inorganic gases, HCl, HF, HBr, SOx, NOx, and then of course we get gases like CO and CO2. Okay, so these all many of these pollutants are really dangerous to human, and this has been a concern. That's why many of countries have thought that okay, waste energy or incineration is not a good idea. Of course, this fly ash, for example, we generate from our incineration can contain many of these PCBs polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, dioxin, furones, and heavy metals, etc. And of course, this wastewater, for example, from uh, this bed scrubbers, if I am generating this wastewater, which actually can be a really toxic in nature. So, these concern has led to think of incinerator in many different ways. Okay, many think that it is not at all a good idea. The biggest concern for uh, this incinerator has been our biggest con uh, concern, which is more publicized is uh, dioxin and furon. If many of you who has read, uh, who have, must have read the book of Rachel Carlson, uh, The Silent Spring, so she was the, uh, the first lady who, you know, uh, brought these issues to the, in the public domain and then, you know, in, in fact, uh, good, uh, did a wonderful job into telling that, okay, there are the concern about dioxin and furons. And, other also she has mentioned in her book, but what are dioxin and furons? So you may be knowing that these are, this chemical structure is of the, the dioxin, which are polychlorinated dibenzoparadioxins, and there are uh, four to uh, I think at least four chlorine atom onto this, and this one is polychlorinated dibenzofuron. So there are approximately seventy-five dioxins in the environment or may have uh, not in, in the environment, but has been invented and seven of them are really toxic to human. And similarly, there are furons uh, at least out of 135 available, there are only 10 of them are toxic. So, this dioxin and furon has led to a, especially in addition to other pollutant has led to a concern that, you know, we do not want to incineration. So, what happens, how, how these dioxin and furons are formed? Once we have hydrocarbons, once we have a chlorine available, this at elevated temperature, this uh, these compounds can form dioxin and furon. And you may be knowing that many of uh, many of them are really toxic, 7 plus plus 10, and they have been found at least to lead to a cancer or all kind of or kind of uh, disorder in human. So that has been uh, you know led to a concern that is why many people think that no incineration. But uh, let me tell you also that you know this toxin and furons forms in the incinerators, but they also form, they also are formed in when we are doing open burning. For example, if we just burn based in open and if it has a chlorinated plastic or some other source of chlorine and then some of course there will be hydrocarbons, it certainly would produce dioxin and furons. So, in incinerator, in fact, we can control them, we can regulate them, uh, and we have some technologies available. But in open burning, probably it will be more dangerous. Okay, so that need to be seen, and in fact, we do not have very good data to tell that how much dioxin and furon are already in the environment. There are just a couple of studies. One is done in Japan for India, which tells that in in some of our food products, I think not exactly food products, but in some places they have found that there is dioxin and furons. Okay. So, do we have control technologies for them? Of course, we have control technologies for dioxin and furons. For example, they can be adsorbed on activated carbon beds and they can also be controlled uh, by regulating the temperature. Okay? So, the another technology uh, uh, similar to incineration is the gasification. I already uh, mentioned about that, but uh, it is a little bit of advanced technology I would say. In fact, in fact, we do not do the complete combustion, but uh, we have partial, partial oxidation. We produce carbon monoxide and hydrogen and then use it for running even gas turbine or using this as a fuel. I would say the gasification is uh, st still not that much commercialized for our, gas, uh, for our uh, MSW system. There are few studies, there are few trials. I 
won't be surprised if you tell me that there are few plants abroad available, but not so far tried commercially in India actually, if, if, I, if I remember correctly. Okay. So, these are basically a couple of methods, incineration, gasification, and you may be knowing that even pyrolysis, for example, similar to gasification, is, that's also tried, I think, in one place, if I remember in Pune, they are trying the pyrolysis. Incineration in Delhi, there are two plants, in a few other, in other places, they are trying it. So, incineration helps in one, one way. For example, it can reduce your uh, mass and volume as high as, let us say, 85 percent or even more than that. So, that is a huge advantage, but then there are other concerns about what do we what do we do with the pollutants okay so let me take a couple of more questions on uh, then gasification and etc silgudi institute of west bengal yeah good afternoon sir so we have calculated the earlier question yeah yeah so it is 1.6 megawatt per day in our city actually siliguri okay and one more, uh, I have one more question actually according, according to the disposal actually. Yeah. So, the composting, the, so composting also can be done by uh, sanitary landfilling, is it possible? So, so sanitary Hello? landfilling is also a biological process, but I would say that it is more anaerobic than aerobic. Should we call it a composting or not? I am not sure about that because in sanitary landfill we just fill it in the landfill and keep it there forever. Okay? So, that uh, should we call it composting? Probably not. Why do you say that that is composting? Okay, sir. sir, my point is if you enlighten some point on plasma incineration. Recently, we heard that uh, from plastic waste mainly, municipal uh, solid plastic waste yeah. by means of plasma incineration, yeah. uh, electric electricity could be generated in a uh, cheaper methodology. You can only tell something. Yeah, so uh, this, I think this institute of plasma something, they are, they are trying that and in fact, I do not know whether it will be cheaper or not, to be honest with you. But of course, they have commercialized this technology, they have uh, given license to a company like Bhagirathi, something private limited or so. I personally do not know whether it is economic or not, but that is another technology which to me is little bit of towards advanced, I would call it advanced technology. You see what happens when a new technology emerges, they claim, I am talking in general, right? they claim that okay, we can do this at a very low cost, but when we start uh, installing it, then there are several issues comes up and once we start resolving them, then the cost may be different what is uh, what is envisioned in, in the beginning. So, it is very difficult to tell whether that plasma technology will be cheaper, but certainly that technology is also there and especially for the biomedical base they are using it. Uh, there are a couple of at least I know that at least there is a plant in Goa which they are pyrolyzing your uh, uh, this biomedical based uh, by using this, this technology. It won't be commercialized. That's very difficult to tell now. So I do have a question uh, yeah, regarding this component separation. Yeah. Uh, as you have mentioned that uh, there was this uh, separation by manual uh, scavenging or something like that. But yeah. uh, is it possible that uh, I guess manual scavenging uh, the government has uh, went against for that? So how is it possible in those uh, industries or places like that? Yeah. So. Uh, so, I think when you are saying that, uh, if I remember, uh, if I understand correctly, so this scavenging what you are mentioning is not banned, but the government has said that if someone is lifting a stool, etc., or feces, human feces, that cannot be done. But this, uh, this sorting, manual sorting is a very, uh, I would say, a method even used in developed countries. So, it is not like you ask people to do it with bare hands, but you have gloves, you have all your gears and then you are, it is basically the, your material is moving on a conveyor belt. For example, I want to remove this bottle, I remove that, I have stone, I remove that, put in different containers. So, you know, it is like the way you do things. If you put it 
without any gears, you are not taking care of uh, hands, you are not taking care of, you. there is no air mask, etc. Of course, that shouldn't be done. But then it can be done in a very scientific manner and if you see any of your uh, own video which I will also show, it is done in almost, almost all uh, facilities even in the developed countries. So, there is no, uh, nothing bad in that. Only the thing is if you start doing it by hand, that certainly should not be practiced and it is then the question of the health of the people. Okay? So, thank, thank you, you very much. So, uh, let us say, so we move further, then we talked about the, the disposal, which is uh, I would say the last destination when you cannot produce or cannot do the biological processes or cannot do the incineration. I do not know, I, the incineration need to be seen in perspective, but whatever is remaining, then if we do not find the solution, then means that need to be disposed of finally. And when we talk about disposal, that there are many ways of disposing, open dumping, which is largely practiced in India, for example. And then many thought that, you know, sea is so big that if we can uh, put some waste or if we allow the waste to go into the sea and ocean, that should be also be okay. But let me tell you very honestly that this is a really bad practice. You are, you are giving your, your problem to the fish. That means, means by that you are giving your problem to the aquatic ecosystems. That is really bad and we should not do that. And then the third option which is scientific one is called landfilling. You dispose your remaining solid waste, residual solid waste in the surface soils of the earth in a scientific manner that is what is called landfilling and that is the which we will discuss now. So, why should we do landfill? So, it is for first of all if you compare it with the open dumping, it is any day it is much much better. And you know even if you have uh, for example, if you do any other use any other technology some residue will always be remaining. So, that need to be put somewhere and that probably uh, the landfill is a good source for that. And if you are doing landfilling as compared to open dumping, you can understand that we are reducing public health and safety uh, and of course, the safety to the environment. Okay. So, what is landfill? It is a controlled disposal of waste on the land. It controls the exposure of the environment and humans to the detrimental effect of solid waste placed otherwise on the land. Disposal is accomplished in a way such that a contact between waste and environment is significantly reduced. So, this is a uh, disposal is not a full proof or final technology, but it is much better than doing nothing. So, for example, if I put it in a very scientific manner, cover it everything so that it is away from human, it is away from the stray animals, it is away from rodents, etc. And that means it cannot spread disease and we are getting away from uh, from the waste. Okay? So, uh, sanitary landfill in that sense is a good idea and in many ways it probably will be cheaper than any other technology. For example, if I compare sanitary landfilling from incinerator, if not considering the cost of land probably sanitary landfilling can be cheaper. So, this is a section view of a typical uh, state of the art landfill. Okay. So, if, if you see here, I have in the bottom of that, I have a kind of liner system. The idea is so that even whatever is generated here, it do not allow the gases, it do not allow the leachate, which is, so you understand what is the leachate, do not allow it to percolate to the groundwater. And on the top of that, we have a leachate collection system. So, whatever groundwater or otherwise the water gener generated inside uh, inside this landfill, this water is collected. There are basically different pipes, perforated pipes. They collect the waste and they collect this liquid and then this liquid is taken to, to a particular place inside the landfill only and then it is treated. Okay? And the another important component is the gas generated. So, this gas eventually because if you see this is a closed system, right? So, what will happen? There will be anaerobic conditions. Sometimes there will be in the beginning there will be aerobic conditions. So, there is some kind of gas will be generated which is the biogas. Remember that the composition of methane will won't be that high as compared to the in the anaerobic digestion system, but still we will have biogas generated here. So, if we allow this biogas to go to the atmosphere, what will happen? It will for example, this biogas contain methane, it is a greenhouse gas. So, that means it will lead to the global warming. 
So we collect all of the biogas here through different gas, gas extraction or gas collection wells and then probably either we flare it or then use it for generating some kind of electricity or some kind of energy. On the top of this everything we put a cover which is called cap system, we basically put a few layers of impervious clay and then some kind of liner and then we close the system. Okay? Because there are two kind of major pollution which can happen near nearby the landfills. One is the groundwater pollution because if this leach, this leach, leach it for example what will happen if it leaches down? It certainly will reach the groundwater and even those, those gases if they are not collected properly they will be coming out. So we should have a system to, to monitor gases and we should have a system to monitor the leachate. So for example if, if you see here there is a, it's not shown here but there is a groundwater monitoring system here and in fact it is also done in upstream so that to see that, okay for example this one. This is a groundwater monitoring well here and this is a groundwater monitoring well downstream. So that we know that once this water has gone or is passing through the, the groundwater is just below the landfill whether this quality is getting affected or not. So this is very critical at least you should have two groundwater monitoring wells and you know what will, what many times happen is this surface water can enter into this landfill. So there should be a very good drainage system in and across this landfill so that this water do not go inside. So these are the few major components you know uh, you may, many of you know this is what I tell to student. In fact in advanced classes we generally ask them to design some of the components but because in this course it is so basic so we do not ask them to design any of the component but this is the a few basic components. I also tell them again that okay this is a liner system, there is a cap system and then there is a gas management system, then leachate management and then there are different monitoring systems. So this is bare minimum what is, what is there in our landfills. So this is a typical interesting uh, f uh, f picture of showing what are the different landfill operations. Um, not many uh, components are visible but if you see this they are spreading the waste here and in the bottom there is a liner and of course there is a soil put on the top of that then they are putting that this is, this is probably the soil required for the soil covering. So this is very interesting. So, so when we put this, uh, when we put this uh, waste in the landfills, it is not that it is put in a single cell. In fact, you will see that in a landfill there are several of cells, one after another. So every day I fill my waste for example here, I put a soil cover on the top of that and then next day I fill it here and again put a soil cover and so on so far. So you will see that these kind of cells are there. Okay? So these kind of uh, cells, cells, cells will be formed and once my landfill is completed I put a good amount of final earth cover or soil cover which could be as thick as 2 feet and this daily earth cover could be just 6 inches or so. So you see this soil covering is interesting but it also cost you. Why? Because first of all you have to find a uh, proper soil which largely should be clay, clay in nature and this soil will also take a good amount of your area okay? because this is ultimately filling otherwise if I do not put this soil, uh, so basically I can put more waste into that. So you have to uh, optimize it, you have to find the local, locally available soil otherwise a good amount of your area, the whole landfill will be, uh, will be taken up the soil. But this is I would say mandatory otherwise there will be problem of uh, order etc in the in your landfill. This is one photo of showing the uh, lichet collection uh, well, it is near to Mumbai, it is a big well, it is not, uh, so they are, I, I think it is not a continuous system but they are collecting uh, lichet there and then maybe taking it out for the treatment. So uh, once this lichet is generated, you may be knowing that you know this is this is a highly uh, contaminated or highly toxic wastewater. So this uh, this need to be treated further. Otherwise, what will happen that if we do not allow, uh, collect it, we do not treat it, then probably it will again lead to your surface and groundwater contamination. So this is a picture showing of a liquid treatment system near to Mumbai. It's a basically sequence batch reactor. If you can see the uh, the irrigation happening here and lot of sloughing happening in the top. 
So we need a, a good amount of leachate treatment systems and you, you will be surprised to know that you know the many of the components in the leachate may not be easily biodegradable. So sometimes we have to think even over sophisticated technologies like the membrane technology. And then when we are talking about all these technologies monitoring then the membranes etc. that is actually leading to a very high cost of your system you know. So people say that oh what is the deal we I take it put into landfill put the soil and compact it that is done. That is not true actually. You have to monitor the gases coming out you have to collect them you have to monitor the leachate you have to monitor the groundwater and then you want to treat this leachate with a very sophisticated technologies that actually will lead to a very high cost. Once you have filled your, uh, your solid in the landfill your job actually is not done you know in fact it should be that even after closing your landfill putting a complete liner on the top of that you should typically monitor and maintain the landfill sites to see whether there is some kind of uh, this liner has not broken up or whether this gas collection system are working or not even for as high as 30 to 50 years. So that means in your management system you should also include the monitoring cost if even for as high as for 30 to 50 years. As per MSW rules in India it recommends that at least for 15 years we should uh, monitor the sites after closing that is also a long time. So that means this also will cost you a lot. And after all this is done these sites basically can be used for recreational parks they can be uh, converted even to stadiums, they can be converted into gardens, even some of people have argued that they can you be used even for making the residential houses etc. Of course, there will be issues of compaction, there will be uneven compaction for many days, but nevertheless these landfills uh, can be used uh, for some other purpose especially making recreational parks etc. There are very uh, few good examples in India where we have uh, restored these landfills and converted into uh, some kind of recreational parks etc. So here is the uh, one example which I give to my student just to estimate how much landfill is required for example, it is uh, you have to estimate it for Mumbai and uh, for example, the question is estimate the landfill area needed to handle one year's MSW for Mumbai assuming national average discard, no combustion and a landfill density of 600 kilogram per meter cube and a single 3 meter lift assume that the 20 percent of the cell volume is soil used for cover ok. So, please if you can uh, solve this so that we will get a chance to talk also. So, this will give you sense that even for dealing of one years of waste for, for a city like Mumbai how much extra area is required and then you can assume what is the cost of the land and then you know how expensive it can be in future. So, you just calculate it we will give you let us say 2 minutes and then we can talk about the sanitary landfills. Bengal Engineering College hello Very how good are afternoon, you? Sir. How are you? Yeah, Very good sir. Very good afternoon. Yeah. So, hello. So, let me ask you a question rather than I, you ask me a question. Ok sir, I am asking a question that was regarding uh, your um, treatment of solid waste uh, by vermicomposting. So, what is the optimum condition that we should maintain if we want to compost the uh, MSW? What is the optimum condition that we should maintain? Uh, ok. So very good question. So, you know this generally this vermicomposting is done at the ambient conditions. Uh, you will for example, the cities or the area like uh, West Bengal it should be wonderfully working. You know it the concern sometime comes when it is very uh, cold area the bombs may not survive so that probably then you have to be put them in an area where the temperature can be maintained. But it is mostly done in ambient conditions. So, it is a question only of maintaining food for example, for them and then the moisture humidity etcetera. You do not have to do much in fact, they will survive in most of conditions like in Bengal. But let me ask you a question the my question is so all four of you teach this course. Uh, we are four participants here. Yeah. 
Yeah, but all of you are teaching this environmental studies course? Uh, no, at least uh, three we are doing this. Okay, so what do you teach in uh, solid waste management? I am uh, teaching uh, environmental studies. Yeah, but do you teach solid waste management? No, you, I am not uh, studying the solid waste management. Other uh, teachers are there, they are uh, studying solid waste management. No, no, so my question is that when you are teaching this environmental studies course, Okay, so do you teach solid waste management as a part of it? Yeah, we have the part that we have in our syllabus content that that con that much we teach to the UG students. Okay, so maybe I can take opinion of the another one who is sitting left to you. Yes, sir. We teach solid waste management. Yeah. So what do you teach in that? Is it different than what we Hello. teach? All which you have taught, all we actually covered in our syllabus. Also. Okay, and what else? We used to teach uh, the topics like the, uh, wh wh what is the importance of solid waste management, then um, how it is generated, uh, then what are the different composition or characteristics we should know for the solid waste, mm -hmm. then the engineered system for mm -hmm. solid waste management and its functional mm -hmm. uh, elements, their interrelation, mm -hmm. then finally we give stress on uh, disposal of solid waste management okay. or uh, disposal of particularly solid okay. waste, then uh, a little bit about U.S. management and biomedical waste also we used to teach. But that is a very small portion, U.S. management and biomedical waste management. Oh, very good. And how many lectures, how many lectures do you take uh, for this? Yes, six hours. Six hours. Five to six hours depending on situation. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you then. So I think uh, we have to stop here for, uh, for a tea break and we will uh, talk to you in 30 minutes at 3.30.